All right, so the meeting is being recorded. Um, why is it a perfect segue? Because one of the really bold things about Wikipedia is its universal character and its universal aspirations. And it's been holding that aspiration since its inception um, for the last uh, 20 years. And we see that both in the content, it's an encyclopedia, which uh, the, the, the very word encyclopedia means complete knowledge. So there is this spirit of universality there. And also in terms of the user base, Wikipedia tries to be universal. It is um, free for all and it tries to be universally accessible. And the only thing that sometimes hinders that is censorship. Uh, but the aspiration is one of universality. And it's also obvious in the vision of the Wikimedia Foundation, which is to empower everyone to share in the sum of all human knowledge. But there are important hurdles towards achieving this universality, both within language versions and across language versions. Within language versions, we see a big skews with respect to important biographical variables of the contributors. For instance, I don't know what the latest number is, but at some point, 90% um, of editors identified as men. And even in readership rather than editorship, we see a majority of men. Across language versions, we see huge disparities um, with uh, respect to the size of Wikipedias, with the number of contributors, also with respect to the quality of content. We have some versions of Wikipedia that have been hijacked uh, by people with a certain political agenda, so that creates disparities. Lowering these um, hurdles and decreasing these disparities that hinder the universality of Wikipedia is, um, is a really important problem for the community. Um, in fact, it's at the very top of the agenda for the Wikimedia movement. In uh, the Wikimedia movement's 2030 strategic direction, knowledge equity is featured as one of, of the two main goals. The other one being um, uh, to enable knowledge as a service. I'm quickly quoting here from the movement's uh, direction. It says, uh, as a social movement, we will focus our efforts on the knowledge and communities that have been left out by structures of power and privilege. We will welcome people from every background to build strong and diverse communities. We will break down the social, political, and technical barriers, preventing people from accessing and contributing to free knowledge. Um, it's, the importance of this mission is what inspired the conversation that uh, we're about to have. Uh, that conversation will be under the motto towards a worldwide Wikipedia. The snippet from the manifesto that I just quoted is very broad and uh, it's inspiring, but there's still a long way to go. And our goal today with this conversation is not to discuss further Wikipedia's universal mission at an abstract level, but rather to dive into the matter at a tangible level from the point of view of concrete real world scenarios. That's why I added a subtitle to the motto, which in its entirety is towards a worldwide Wikipedia, one step at a time. And this is also why we invited the two guests whom I'm about to introduce to you. They are both not only visionaries when it comes to connecting people all over the world to knowledge, they're also people who have gotten their hands dirty on the job. Before I introduce these guests though, I would like to spend just a minute thinking about what we want to achieve in this conversation. What is the criterion that we should meet in order to be able to say that the conversation was a success? Um, and what I propose is to pick one concrete place on earth, let's say Kenya, um, and to imagine two concrete people in Kenya and think about the problems that they're facing today linked to Wikipedia and how we could overcome those problems one step at a time. The two uh, the two groups of people that I propose to think about are supposed to represent Wikipedia's two main user groups, which are readers on the one hand and editors on the other hand. So let's think of Richard the reader and Esther the editor, two Wikipedia users from Kenya. By the way, I'm not proposing Kenya because it plays a particular role from the Wikipedia perspective, but in the spirit of really keeping us grounded and concrete, and also because our first guest is from Kenya. Her name is Catherine Adea, and she is the director of research at the World Wide Web Foundation, where she is responsible for co coordinating a research team dedicated to understanding and removing the most important barriers to achieving the vision of a web that is safe and empowering for everyone. 
She began her career as a research fellow at the United Nations University's Institute for New Technology in Maastricht in the Netherlands. She then moved back to Africa in order to expand opportunities and to drive development there using the web and digital technologies. And she has pursued this mission uh, in a very broad sense within the public, private uh, sectors and within uh, the civil society sector, as well as with international organizations. So welcome, Catherine, and greetings to Nairobi from where you are joining us today. Our other guest is Denny Brandicic. He is head of special projects at the Wikimedia Foundation, where he leads the work on abstract Wikipedia and on wiki functions. These are two new uh, Wikimedia projects that Danny will tell us about uh, himself in a bit, I hope. Previously, he was with Google, where he worked on the, knowledge, uh, on the Google Knowledge Graph. And before that, uh, he received a PhD from the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany. Many of you may know Danny as a founder of Wikidata, the knowledge base that today backs important aspects of Wikipedia. And uh, in the keynote, Yolanda also gave a brief shout out to Danny already, so we are all primed. Um, also, Danny was, a uh, was the founder of the Croatian version of Wikipedia. So welcome, Danny, and hi to Berkeley, California, from where you are joining us today. So uh, to open up, uh, the discussion. I just want to kind of throw some quick uh, speedballs uh, at the two of you. Catherine, one of your missions with the World Wide Web Foundation is to bring the web closer to people all over the world. What role does Wikipedia play in your work? Uh, Bob, can I at least just even say hello and uh, thank you for the invite. And the fact that I've never really had a lot to do with Wikipedia and I think I've been I feel like I've been thrown under a bus, but I'm willing to be under that bus for this particular <laughs> meeting. <laughs> with a lot of people in it too. <laughs> so, you know, I, when, when I think of this question, the first thing I ask myself just very briefly is, would Wikimedia exist without the World Wide Web? So uh, when Satim invented the World Wide Web, he did it out of love to make the web for good. And I, I think I read somewhere in one of the Wired magazines that Wikipedia was also built on love. For that alone, Wikipedia has a role to play uh, as we aim for a web for good. Uh, and Wikipedia's goal is really to provide the sum of human knowledge. Again, I've read this somewhere, available to everyone for free. And at the moment, it is already one of the most successful collaborative uh, efforts in the internet, but with many challenges that I think we'll discuss as we go along. So uh, just a quick one, I'll just give you high level. Our interest in the World Wide Web, access and affordability women's rights online. Remember, women are very unlikely to be online compared to men. We have the data. Data rights, first is critical. People are to fully embrace the web or even to fully embrace Wikipedia. So with those, Wikipedia has similar concerns, but in line with content and contributions. So we need Wikipedia to assist us, whether it's the World Wide Web or us, as even people where I come from, to manage the issues above, for example, without meaningful connectivity, which I'll mention later what it is, basically access and affordability, without more women being online, without more people trusting data on the web, then Wikipedia's work will be in vain. Thank you. Great, thanks a lot. I'm looking forward to unpacking these issues uh, in what is about to come. Uh, Denny, uh, Wikimedia runs through your CV like a red thread. Nearly 10 years ago, you worked with Wikimedia Deutschland, then you moved to Google, and now you're back with the Wikimedia Foundation. What caused your move? The same reason I moved to Wikimedia Deutschland back then for Wikidata from academia. Basically, I believe that the Wikimedia movement is the place to do this kind of projects. Um, it shouldn't uh, be done by a, um, by a for-profit entity and um, big changes to the Wikimedia project should really come from the Wikimedia movement itself and be done by the Wikimedia um, organizations. Great, uh, thank you. That's great to hear. It's great to hear that uh, there is such a big role uh, to be played um, by this community. Um, so let's jump in uh, towards those questions that I mentioned in my, uh, in my introduction. Uh, and let's, let's go to a concrete place. Let's go to Kenya. Um, the Kiswahili Wikipedia is one of the biggest Wikipedias written in an African language. It has about 61,000 articles, and it's the second most popular Wikipedia version in Kenya and in Tanzania, after English in each of those countries. 
So, um, Catherine, I'm wondering what role does Wikipedia play in life in Kenya, um, on the ground in uh, every day? In your experience, is Wikipedia used in similar or in radically different ways in Kenya compared to other places, let's say Europe or North America? You know, when I listen to your question, I'm trying to debate how honest should I be? How should I balance? But I'm behind the screen, so let me just be as honest as possible. <laughs> and first of all, by the way, thank you for getting it correct. Kiswahili is the language. It's not Swahili. And you know, the funny thing is this is such a common mistake that is now so widely accepted. I even get confused myself and it's not your fault uh, mm -hmm. because many people now use them interchangeably, but please do remember Kiswahili is the language. And then when I think about our education system, our education system in Kenya is English first. I speak Kiswahili. Then we have very many local languages. I speak Luo. Most Kenyans on average are going to speak four languages. Uh, and then you're going to find that in many Wikipedia pieces that I've looked at, and I'll be very frank, they're written first in English, then translated into the other languages. So for example, you translate into Kiswahili. And the content is not always relevant. So some people, we may search, but let me tell you, it's not necessarily for many of us in research and social in this country, our first go-to place. You'll go there and you'll want to verify something else. And I'll give an example. I need to think, uh, like for example, if I think in, uh, I'm, I'm Luo, my mother tongue, I first spoke in Luo when I was born. So I always think in Luo, then I had to translate it into English. Then I'm speaking in Kiswahili. So this is where the university's linguistics uh, and languages department could really help. Uh, and I wanted to give you an example, uh, Bob and uh, the rest if you don't mind. I always remember uh, I had a professor in my university and undergraduate who spoke Luo first. So he was Luo. Then he spoke Kiswahili. Then he did his master's in English and did his PhD in Russia. So one day in class, I was asking him a question and he said something like, he meant to say, Catherine, clarify what you're asking. But this is what he said, I've never forgotten. Catherine, put me clearly. You know, that was the direct translation from the language. So if you don't get it right and you mix, you, you need to get the experts to be able to help you think deeper into what really you need in that language and what the context is. And you've even asked me about Europe. Um, I lived in Europe. I've lived in Kenya. <clears throat> I used Wikipedia more in Europe than I did in Kenya. And maybe it's because the content that I was finding in Europe was even more relevant, more factual, more correct. In Kenya, there is so much content that is wrong. I, 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 that's why I said I feel like I've been thrown under a bus because I was one person who had packed Wikipedia aside. Uh, when there's content of very key people, for example, that are very relevant, that is so wrong. I'll give you an example. One of the great Pan-Africanists in Kenya, P.E. Lolo Mumba, um, is, still read, uh, is still written that he's, I don't know what, he's teaching at the law school where he left three years ago. And he's doing so many things in the Pan-African movement. I, I would like to talk about my father who was a famous trade union. So that's a whole different story. So I think my point here is that um, there's so much content. There's so much that is available from legitimate sources. So do we go to Wikipedia first? Uh, the jury is out. But what I may advise is that we must invest in research. We must invest. Volunte volunteerism, is there a word like that? Volu to volunteer, to volunteerism, it has its role. But proper research cannot be compromised, especially for some content, to give it credibility and reliability. Uh, and especially a lot of stuff from the developing countries, I'll be frank with you, like from Kenya, is quite poorly researched. I'm not criticizing, there's a, real, a lot of good material, but when you balance, so when you go to a few and you get poorly written material, you give up on the whole thing. And the second thing is, it's very hard to get a lot of good people to volunteer, there must be a balance. And I'll talk about the meaningful connectivity that I was going to talk about, uh, I mean, whenever you want, at whatever point, because you've got things like access, affordability, you've got women, there has to be a balance. How do I get these people to contribute? And then finally, you have to focus on issues that matter to that country or to that context. Where is the pain point? Where is the pain point? So sometimes I look at the content or I look at some of the people who are the key people on Wikipedia in our country. It's all the, what's in Kenya, we call, we call them in Kenya, the celebs. So I don't know what you call them elsewhere. So they may just be people who are always out there. And doesn't mean that they are the people who 
really everybody wants to hear about. Mm -hmm. So maybe let me leave it there because um, you could ask me more questions. I could talk forever. And uh, I said, you throw me under the bus, I'm willing to be there. <laughs> I think you raised, uh, you raised a great point. You need to get, you said, you need to get people to contribute. And um, here I would like to turn uh, to Denny because he has this experience from um, co-founding or founding one of the Wikipedia versions. It was the Croatian one um, in, in your case, Denny. Um, so what does it take to build up a strong community of contributors from the ground up? And do you think it's a process that can be repeated all over the world? Um, what would it take to, to build a, a Luo Wikipedia? It might already be there, but what would it take to flesh it out? Um, that's a great question, and I really don't know the answer to that one. Um, it's not that I went to the Croatian Wikipedia with the intent to found it or whatever. It's just it, it's, it's something that happened. It was just the, one of the first ones there, and 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 started doing things, and became the first administrator and so on. But. Um, but really, I didn't have a plan of going there and thinking, oh, this is what we need to do and stuff like this. It's just like, okay, let's start. This is an encyclopedia. I want to write it also in Croatian. I want to make it available in Croatian and so on. So um, I really don't know what uh, it takes. What it obviously takes is volunteers. What it takes is uh, for people who feel that they can do this, that they want to do this, that they have the time to do this and uh, to actually go in and, and do it. And we need plenty of those. It's not enough to have you know, one, two or three. You need, you need a community there to, to build that. And um, knowledge creation in the time of Wikipedia is really a community effort. So what we would need for Lua is basically to have people who are comfortable writing content in Lua and um, who have the time, who have the ability and who have the, to have access to the web uh, in a, in a, in a um, strong way that they can actually uh, go in and, um, and, and write. <laughs> That's basically what we need. I mean, with the project that um, I'm working on now with AppSec Wikipedia, I hope to actually free up more of those resources to make it uh, to make it available. We can uh, talk about this then when we get to it. Great. Yes, we'll definitely get uh, to that. Um, but maybe harking back to that immediately, um, Catherine, what do you think, uh, given this scenario that that Danny just described, um, having having a good strong internet access? having uh, being comfortable writing in a local language. You say uh, Kenya is English first, right? So that might already be uh, be problematic, I guess. How do you see the uh, the constellation? Is um, Are we set up for success or w uh, are there huge hurdles to be overcome? Uh, frankly, go to write is not a problem. Even I, as I'm talking to you, I can write in Luo, I can write in English, I can write in Kiswahili. Time may be a different factor especially to volunteer, yeah? Uh, so it's getting the balance and getting people to be able to do it consistently. And maybe it requires some strategic thinking on how it can be done. It's not impossible. Uh, but then now you bring in an issue that if you allow me, maybe then I'll bring in something from the Web Foundation, which is so critical in countries like, especially in the global South or countries like Kenya. Uh, and that is also people who have meaningful connectivity. You know, people who, we talk about meaningful connectivity. Many people may not understand that meaningful connectivity is a, a tool to raise the bar for internet access. And uh, this is a work that's done at the uh, Alliance for Affordable Internet, which is under the Web Foundation. And we look at it under four dimensions, regular inter internet use, minimum threshold, daily use. How many people in the global South, for example, are able to use the internet daily? An appropriate device enough data, that's the problem. Like I was very worried, I was really praying that I'm going to be able to have this meeting and I'll not be embarrassed by uh, dropped connections and things like that. And, uh, and a fast connection, minimum threshold, 4G mobile connectivity. So, you know, you need people to be able to have this. And this is, some, this is the work we're doing in the Web Foundation to make one understand that, hey, to get access, to get more people to be more included, you need this. And so when I look even at Wikipedia, you want more people to volunteer. You know, uh, what Danny has said, Danny has said is excellent. But if it was Catherine, I would have found it easier to do it when I lived in Europe than when I lived in Kenya. If that answers the question, but I would do it. 
I find this uh, very interesting angle because it's it's an angle that we rarely uh, think about. I think uh, I'm speaking for myself, but uh, also uh, Danny's approach is more at the. I'm thinking of this as a as a high as a stack of you know you need the very basics. You even need to be able to go online, and then there's a whole layering. And at the very top, we can maybe have software tools that uh, that support people in creating content and so on. And Danny has been doing a lot of work in that direction. So uh, the, the buzzword here is, is abstract uh, Wikipedia, um, which is a project that uh, you already introduced uh, two years ago at the Wiki Workshop in San Francisco. Um, so it makes us very proud uh, that we kind of got the sneak preview uh, two years ago at that. Back then you were still with Google, now you're um, with Wikimedia. Um, and you're working with full force um, on abstract Wikipedia. So maybe, Danny, you can say a few words uh, to, or in order to introduce uh, everyone to abstract Wikipedia. How does it work? What purpose does it serve? And how does it connect to this problematic uh, that we're talking about today? The idea of abstract Wikipedia is basically an extension of what we already did in Wikidata, to have one common knowledge base that everyone can contribute to no matter what the language is. And then to have this content be translated to the individual languages and be able to be read by any of the um, contributing languages. So this means that someone can uh, contribute, for example, in Bengali, and it can be read in Lua, or, or someone can contribute in, um, in Hausa, and it can be read in Igbo, and they don't have to think, oh, should I contribute now to the English Wikipedia and have more readers, or should I contribute to my local Wikipedia and uh, and, and write about it? So you're not splitting the um, the community effort in this direction anymore. In order to create a kind of baseline Wikipedia, so don't expect uh, because this is obviously a difficult problem to actually generate language about this kind of topic. So don't expect this to replace you know the core articles um, of in each uh, Wikipedia in each culture, but it's like a baseline of knowledge that should be available to all Wikipedias. So that, um, for example, one of the things that I experienced when starting on the creation Wikipedia is I really wanted to write about the island where my mom was from. I wanted to write about a little village she, um, she is from. I wanted to write about a little town where my dad is from. But you know, how could I justify having an encyclopedia that has an article of, of, about a village with 160 people, but doesn't have yet an article about Nigeria? So it was like, it, it felt like I first have to describe the whole world before I can get to the things that I actually want to write about. And what, what knowledge do I have about Nigeria? What knowledge do I have about the Congo? I don't have any reasonable knowledge to actually write the articles about it. I mean, you could look it up and so, but so could anyone else. I would like to contribute about the things that I was actually knowledgeable about. And this is true for, for many people in many cultures. They should be writing about their cultures, should be writing what they know about, should write about their experiences, to provide their voices to it. So having a background, a baseline of knowledge available, frees up the communities not to have to write about all these topics. You don't have to write, you know, about uh, species in, in continents far away. They don't have to write about towns in Croatia. They don't have to write about uh, historical people in Russia and so on, but they can actually focus on their own, um, on their own people, on their own histories, on their own um, towns and villages. So the idea is, as I said, everyone can contribute to this common knowledge base because it's written in an abstract way. This is where the name of it could be the abstracting from the specific natural languages and then being translated into the natural languages for reading. So it looks like the normal Wikipedia, but at the same time, it is more comprehensive because everyone's contributing to it. It is more up to date. It's more current because you know uh, everyone is working on a single date set instead of you know we have three hundred different languages and who knows how up to date each of them are. Um, and it's hopefully more correct because we have more eyeballs seeing it, following Linus' law that given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow, right? So if we have more people working on the common knowledge base, we will have more correct, more current, more comprehensive knowledge available to all of the languages. And then the local communities can still focus on the topic 
topics that they really care about um, and write even more about them, stuff that they can't express in the probably limited expressibility that um, abstract Wikipedia will allow to them. So abstract Wikipedia is really a goal to enable the communities to create a baseline of knowledge and then to add the knowledge, which means there will also be, um, you will actually find about a lot of more topics in your language, the information, you don't have to switch over to another language just because it's, you know, the language of education in your country or the language of um, a, a higher, um, uh, a language that has more prestige or whatever, but you can actually stay in your native language where you're most comfortable with and read the content and access the knowledge. So this is the goal of AppSec Wikipedia. So this, uh, this would be a solution to the problem that Catherine mentioned earlier about the um... Um, the Africanist, uh, whose name, I would, unfortunately, I, I, I would never call it the solution. I would always call it the contribution because we're not going to solve anything with technology. We're just providing tools that help yeah. other find solutions. <laughs> and so, so maybe we can go back to our concrete uh, scenario that I sketched in the beginning. We have uh, we have Esther, the editor, who wants to contribute to the Kiswahili um, to to Wikipedia in general, um, and now she let's. Catherine told us that Kenya is uh, English first in terms of education, so it's kind of, it would probably be unrealistic to think that she only speaks Kiswahili. But let's assume that there is uh, someone who only speaks and writes Kiswahili, and now they want to contribute um, to Abstract Wikipedia. Maybe we can play this through very concretely. How this? And let's assume there is good internet access, so the lowest level level is is solved. Um, but what would be the the steps and it's it's clear that it's not there yet because you're still building this but in your vision how would this uh what would the workflow be esther would basically come to a website which is completely translated in kiswahili the other content is already in kiswahili and she could decide on which topics she would work and find uh, either find gaps in the knowledge base, like, oh, there are things that are nothing written about, or there are things that are missing about a specific information, about a specific topic, um, or find things that are incorrect um, for some reason. And then she could, using a form-based interface likely, um, edit the content in abstract Wikipedia and, um, and contribute for it. So this would be like the, the the, mo the strongest kind of co um, contribution. People who are actually willing to edit the abstract content in Wikipedia and create more in the common knowledge base. The editing is again, completely in Kiswahili. It's not in English or whatever, um, but uh, just like with Wikidata, you can actually edit everything in uh, Kiswahili and contribute in it without having to know any of the other languages. But there are many other modes of contribution. Esther could also, for example, if she's not that confident with the abstract interface, for example, just contribute lexicographical knowledge about Kiswahili. For example, what are the words um, that represent a specific concept? What are the forms of the verbs that we already have in, um, in the lexicographic extension of Wikidata and so on, so that we can use this to actually generate a natural language? the interface would guide her and tell her, oh, if you want to contribute this kind of information, here's what we're interested in. Um, if you want to contribute this kind of information, here's where you can work on it and so on. So we would have all kinds of flows where we hope that we can gather as many as possible contributors and volunteers to, to help us build the common knowledge base that will make more and more knowledge uh, available. If everything goes well, she will also always see the impact of her work. Like how many people are actually reading the things? How many, how much more knowledge did they unlock with the system that I, uh, with, the, with my contributions and so on. So um, this would be roughly the interface you would be working in. Mm -hmm. Catherine, what uh, what do you think? I think um, I'm, um, I could jump in in, uh, in very many different ways. And first of all, I honestly congratulate uh, Denis for I, I read through what you're trying what you're doing with the abstract Wikimedia, and I think it's brilliant. Um, I, I think there's a real opportunity there. I don't intend to take away from it. I think one of the things I appreciate that you've even said is that it is more complex than simply translating the context in an abstract way to the languages. And so my issue would be more of the relevance of the content and the source. But to be uh, a, a bit more candid, and maybe uh, it's, it's good to maybe contextualize a little bit. 
Kiswahili is not just spoken in Kenya. Let's agree, Kiswahili has a wide reach. And uh, uh, right now, I know even uh, South Africa is planning to introduce Swahili into the education system. But uh, for those who know, Kiswahili is spoken in the wider East Africa, Congo, Rwanda, we are, we are, we are, we are many. And uh, uh, to contextualize further, when I was saying um, about my education system, I come from the Generation X. So gener Generation X were taught Queen's English, then Kiswahili was an optional subject with French and German. So if you are thinking global, we are thinking about the future, we are thinking where we would be, of course, we're going to choose French and German. But now the current, the generation that came up to Generation X, Kiswahili is now a compulsory language. And trust me, there are very people who prefer to read in Kiswahili. It's just that uh, is there content for them. So I may be very eloquent in English and all that, but there are very many others. In fact, there are Kiswahili newspapers. I look at, uh, so there's, a, there's a man who drives me. He only rushes for the Kiswahili paper. And when you look at their content, their content is sometimes a little different to suit what they're interested in. They're not interested in all these great definitions of abstract media. What they, what they want to know is what is this, you know? So um, I think uh, it, 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 what I'm basically uh, trying to say is the example that uh, Denny has given is, uh, is very relevant. But when I think of Robert, uh, I don't know how much time I have, but um, I like the way you thought of uh, Esther and Robert. And I wondered how real these people would be and maybe how much the Wikipedia has consulted uh, and edited people, uh, Robert and, uh, and, and uh, Richard and Esther. The reader and the editor. I think, sorry, I think Richard, Richard is actually more real than Esther, in my context. Uh, but Richard gets disappointed often, depending on his region, country, or locality. His disappointment is sometimes with Esther. I found myself writing that. She tries hard, but sometimes her good is not good enough. And there are many reasons for that, which we've raised. I'm seeing people raising them in the chat. There are many. We are aware about them. But Richard may want to read more, but meaningful connectivity may be a challenge, which I've said, and other issues as well. However, it is more of a challenge, actually, to Esther who wants to be able to provide quality, but has other challenges as well that may not easily be addressed by the current Wikipedia model. And that's why I actually like this abstract, uh, uh, the abstract Wikipedia that he's talking about. So I think it's time for Wikimedia as it implements its excellent study or knowledge gaps. And even having just from like what we have right now is a real opportunity to bridge the, the gap between Richard and Esther. And I like the fact that you use Richard and Esther. They could even court each other more closely and maybe we could have a marriage very soon. Thank you. <laughs> That's a, I think it's a, it's a great hint because um, you're, you're alluding to, these, uh, to the human aspects of, uh, of knowledge creation, right? There is, the, there is the, the bare facts, but then there's also the people that you need to have in order to, to get the work done. Um, and so I'm... I'm, I'm wondering uh, to what extent uh, abstract Wikipedia can help with, with that, um, Danny. Do you think that, um, will it also help in creating communities of humans who co-create knowledge or will it mostly be a tool for making uh, the humans that already do it more productive? I really hope that we will actually grow the number of Wikimedians working on um, the, uh, on the different projects. Um, we started with Wikidata where like uh, more than half of the people contributing to Wikidata actually have never been contributing to Wikimedia projects before. So we did uh, have an influx of completely new contributors and I hope to achieve that with AppSec Wikipedia and Wikifunctions as well. One of the reasons is, is actually that I, that I believe that we can maybe achieve that is that currently if you look at underrepresented languages, if you look at Lua, that, which as far as I understand doesn't have a Wikimedia uh, language edition, um, you know, why doesn't it have one? Is um, there are plenty of speakers of it, but for, for many of them, and it's the same thing with creation when I started with it, it has changed since then. Um, you don't necessarily believe that you're doing anything substantial here because how could you write a whole encyclopedia? You can't write. And if you don't see enough other people contributing, 
you don't think, oh, well, this will never go anywhere. It's like an open source project which you're completely trying to stand by yourself and it's a big project. You, you can't, you need more contributors. You need the confidence that it can actually work out, that you can have a comprehensive encyclopedia in your language and so on. Um, otherwise, you're not actually willing to contribute and you might think, well, it's actually much more effective if I contribute in English or in Kiswahili or in any other language which is already there and bigger and um, has a much bigger chance chance of succeeding. In fact, more than half of our language editions, about 150 Wikipedias, have fewer than 10 active contributors. And you know, 10 people in their free time, can they really build a complete encyclopedia? That's, that's challenging. And the belief of that might just keep more people away from it. With abstract Wikipedia, I hope that we can, you know, create a perception and the actual substance too, but also form a perception that we will have a comprehensive Wikipedia in your language, in your native language. You don't have to switch to, to another language. You don't have to give up and just, you know, go to Facebook and chat with your friends instead, but you can actually contribute to a project which has a fair chance of succeeding, which kind of gives you more energy, which gives you a boost, which gives you, yes, we can do this. And you can see the places where the knowledge is missing, you can go in and contribute to it. So, so the hope is that we can actually change, you know, the whole incentive mechanism around the Wikipedia, or particularly around the smaller Wikipedia projects, in order to make it more believable that your contributions are actually substantial, that your contributions can actually make a big difference. And once we have more content, we will probably show up in more searches and people will actually be confident about, you know, going to Wikipedia and search for the knowledge in their language. Um, I hear so often stories of people who are, who are speaking a smaller native language and then uh, they say, oh, I don't even look up the knowledge in, in, in my language because I can read English anyway. I just go to the English Wikipedia. Why should I do it? And you know, the Israeli Wikipedia, the Croatian Wikipedia or whatever, you know. Um, and the same thing is happening in many other languages. Um, there's a map, if you can find it and show it, I have trouble with the spelling stuff, which shows which language Wikipedias are the ones who are most accessed in each, um, in, a, in a given country. And you can see, you know, the list of those languages which I access around the world is pretty small. So um, in many, many countries, people access a different language uh, edition than what is actually even the standard language of their country. So uh, here it is. So you can see, um, even in places like my native Croatia, uh, English is the most uh, accessed Wikipedia. If you go to Central Asia, you see Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, the other countries, they're all using the Russian Wikipedia instead of their own native Wikipedia, which exists, which has tens of thousands of articles. In Africa, you, you can see, the, the history the Europeans imposed on, uh, on Africa very clearly and uh, which countries are using English and it's almost, there's no language that uses Kiswahili, for example, um, as, uh, there's no country which uses the Kiswahili Wikipedia as the main Wikipedia. Um, and I really hope that AppSec Wikipedia will eventually make this map mm -hmm much more colorful, much more diverse, and uh, oh, in this case, actually much more gray because gray is the one switch. Um, and and, um, and um, that we will have access to knowledge in many more languages that we currently have. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's, it's a good point. Uh, I even have the stats for, uh, for Kiswahili. Um, even in, in Kenya uh, and Tanzania, uh, it's 96% usage of English. Uh, and only about 4% uh, is Kiswahili, which is the second uh, most viewed uh, language version in those countries. I think we could discuss for a long time, but at this point, I want to open it up to the audience because I saw uh, by like with, with one quarter of an eye monitoring the chat a bit, I think there are a lot of questions. So um, Isaac, do you want to uh, pick a question and, um, and throw it at our panel? Sure. Um, I think I'll just go with the first question, which goes back to the very start of the panel and was sparked by a comment uh, Denny made about the distinction between industry and Wikimedia. And the question I think goes to both of you, though, which is what roles do you envision for university labs in shaping Wikipedia and the web in general? Yes. Um... <sighs> 
university labs have, based on my experience, um, have the great opportunity that you can actually sit down and think, that you can go and analyze problems. And um, I see university labs always uh, having a multitude of um, responsibilities. One responsibility is to, to raise problems, to, 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 to find and describe them and to actually tell us, look, this thing is not going well. Um, one um, responsibility of university labs is to try out crazy ideas to see how they can work and um, ideally plug them in into existing systems and see how they would actually change and benefit from that. Um, but also, you know, to, to think beyond the, the short term cycles in industry, for example, to, to think um, um, with an eye on, on um, what changes that are really profound could be made if we change um, certain basic ideas and foundational systems. But also on the other side, for example, then think, uh, systems like Wikipedia or um, Wiki functions in the future will have a lot of interfaces where you can plug in results from the uh, from the research labs and uh, see how does this work out and so on. And I don't expect you know research labs to provide production ready code. Um, and production ready systems, but I, I, but I would hope to find, you know, ideas, inspirations that can then be taken up by, um, by, by systems like Wikipedia and, and implemented there again. It's also, don't think that Wikipedia is all production ready code. We actually have a vast um, ecosystem around us, which is, com which is coming from, from volunteers, contributors, and so on. And the code quality is very uneven in this, in this space. And we're still somehow managing to pass by. So um, there's a lot of opportunity for research labs to have, um, to have major impact and to, to try out ideas. The, the lovely thing about the Wikipedia project is that we provide so much data and make it available, which can be analyzed. Um, it's, it's not just you know the content in the Wikipedia's. We provide every single edit, every single history. All of these things can can really be be used to look into it to see how in, how the incentives work in the world. How what are the correlations between you know contributions from a specific region and um, and for example the demographic and economic uh, uh, numbers in these regions. How do specific changes in the software affect affect um, specific demographics. All of these things I would love to um, have researchers working on. And depending on your background, there's so much more you can do. I comment briefly on that, uh, Robert. Yes, absolutely. Because, uh, you know, I've got a background in academia and uh, I've, I've jumped from academia, come back outside, but I, I now see not I now see, the role for academia is clear, but it's just that sometimes, especially in some of our constituencies, it's not very well appreciated. And the question is asked, I'm thinking more, my mind just went to an African port. You know, an African port was the place where people used to convene around as somebody's stirring and cooking things. That's why I'm seeing them. And because they've got, they've got the convening power. This, uh, Many of the universities, uh, as, as he's saying, can convene those people in the grassroots, can convene these editors and the volunteers, can even convene their students. They've got the language departments. I just think that uh, universities have got such a huge opportunity, especially in the global south that is underutilized. Uh, we're always looking for somebody else first. And I'm not being critical, but we've got some fantastic uh, universities that could actually assist. So I think it's more of a collaborative way of doing it, but I see the port. My mind just keeps going back to the port. That's great. Um, Isaac, um, do we have more questions? Yeah, we've got uh, two, I think, kind of about abstract Wikipedia. So maybe more specifically for Denny, but I think uh, Catherine had already made some points about this too. So I would encourage her to chime in if she has thoughts. Um, but the first one is how to kind of handle the tension that abstract Wikipedia adds this additional layer of abstraction and therefore would seem to raise the threshold to contribute from people from traditionally represented Wikipedia and just thinking about that tension and yeah, comments on that. We're thinking about this problem 
a lot. So we will really throw major UX resources at hoping to resolve that and figure out how to make editing Wikipedia as easy as possible, even with the abstract um, uh, layer in between. And you know, editing Wikipedia currently is already not exactly trivial. Um, so it's it's not that we're <laughs> that we're uh, competing with the the easiest editing interface in the world. Um, but, but still, you're completely right. Um, we will have to work on a UX that is as inclusive as possible. Now. Um, Given that the benefits are so much higher because you're contributing to all of the language editions immediately, we still think that even if the interface doesn't manage to become um, as easy as editing you know, natural text, um, we hope that this will still be worthwhile because you're basically editing in several hundred languages at once. So we hope that this angle can you now help with, 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 with creating incentives for overcoming the hurdle. And, and finally, we're not taking away the possibility to actually write a natural language because we're just, we're just augmenting the Wikipedia, so we're not replacing them. So you can still contribute in your actual natural language and just write the articles and, and layer that on top of what you, what you would be doing in abstract Wikipedia. So, um, and this will become hopefully more interesting and um, and uh, again, there will be more motivation to do that because you are you're contributing already to a pretty um, pretty well established encyclopedia, not not uh, not creating you know a uh, fresh from the start one. So um, I hope that we will have for different people and the different. Um, skills and motivations to have uh, more channels than we have today to actually contribute to knowledge. One thing, for example, is that we are thinking currently very hard to, so uh, uh, the Wikimedia Foundation launched uh, relatively recently a Wikipedia app on KaiOS. KaiOS is a um, low resource um, operating system, which is as far as I understand it, widely used in Africa, which doesn't require as many resources and as a powerful um, smartphone as others. It basically works on a feature phone. And we are thinking like, can we actually integrate a contribution interface into KaiOS, um, into the KaiOS Wikipedia app to make it uh, possible for, for people to contribute even in, um, you know, with, with this kind of technological um, setting and not to have the barrier of you requiring a pretty good smartphone or if you're requiring maybe a laptop even or something like that in order to contribute. So there are many different options where we can have contributions flowing into the system and make it um, and and make more knowledge accessible to everyone. I don't mind jumping in to maybe just uh, also be frank that I used Wikipedia right now as I was sitting here because I wanted to tie in a paper I read from Denny uh, on wiki functions and and abstract Wikimedia. So at least uh, Wiki, Wikipedia was able to tell me that uh, what Wiki functions are and why it's closely related to abstract Wikimedia. And then I, then from your paper, I began to see uh, great opportunities in abstract Wikimedia, depending on how uh, it's done. Because I think one of the things that I appreciate, especially, is the Wiki functions. Uh, which has a secondary goal, it's providing a comprehensive library of functions. And so what I really like there is that it's going to enable people without programming background to compute answers to many questions, either through wiki functions or through third party sites. I think that's really attractive and accessing the function. What I also found very attractive was that wiki functions and abstract uh, uh, Wikimedia are expected to drive a number of research directions knowledge representation. So there's a real opportunity here. But I think what you also appreciate, Danny, which I, so I'm not saying that it's now a criticism from me, it's, it was in your own words. You said a major risk is that uh, contributing to abstract Wikimedia and Wiki functions becomes too difficult. So you see the difficulty element there is some of the things we need to demystify and maybe be able to uh, bring it to the level that it could help everybody get to the same goal. And because all of us, whether it's a World Wide Web, whether it's Wikimedia, we are all trying to get to one goal. And the goal is to bring more inclusivity in the digital, more digital inclusivity. 
So we tie it to access, we tie it to working collaboratively. So this is really an opportunity. But as you say, there are some difficulties in it. Um, I was wearing my academic hat and I was seeing opportunities, but I love that you actually criticized yourself. So I didn't have to do it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, Catherine, I, I totally agree. I mean, this is exactly the, uh, the thing that really, really worries me to make, not make it too complicated. And I would love to have um, insights there. We already um, are planning to have UX research and UX design specifically work with, with, um, with uh, communities and people in, um, in Africa, in India and so on, and to understand exactly what are the barriers to contributions and what might be the barriers to contributing to our UX and how can we actually overcome those. Um, but I would love to uh, hear from someone with your background as well and have you maybe as a kind of advisor or something for the project to, so that we can come to you and say, do you think this can work? Or, and, and what I actually really love is that you brought up the Wikifunctions projects, which I having a very terrible hard time to sell. I mean, the abstract Wikipedia project is like, yeah, more knowledge to everyone. But I also think more functions to everyone. This is awesome, you know, this can help so many people. But I'm having a terrible time to actually explaining what are functions? Why are they useful to people? And to find uh, uh, to find a way to how to you know um, to, to tell this story to, to to narrate this thing. And and I'm, I'm really looking forward to for help with with how to tell this part of the story. And I'm, I'm super glad that you're excited about that part. <laughs> no, I, I like. As I mentioned, I'm under the bus. So if you want to join me under there, I might demystify what I'm thinking about in terms of wiki functions. If you don't mind, uh, Robert, I'm seeing somebody asking a question huh, on the abstract Wikimedia. And is there a plan to monitor the content bias? We know that every language edition has its own biases. Is there a risk that the largest community's vision on a topic can spread in all languages? Correct. The risk does exist. The risk definitely exists. And I even see it even in my own country where there are certain languages that just, or, or certain uh, categories that might overtake and slowly push away the smaller ones. Then you're forced to think in a certain box. I think this is an excellent question from Tizano Picardi and what you've written there is correct. I, I do agree with it. It's something that has to be considered. Thank you. So I, I think, uh... The energy is uh, is rising, but unfortunately, it's the time to wrap up already. Um, and let me let me do this by throwing uh, another uh, ball at each of you, um, which is kind of to reflect a bit on we we set ourselves this this motto uh, toward a worldwide Wikipedia one step at a time. So now one hour later, um, maybe we can take it can't be expected that in an hour we we solve a lot. But I would like to ask if if there are any new perspectives that the two of you might be taking away uh, from this today, perspectives that you hadn't seen before, because I think if that's the case, then we would already have achieved something good. Danny, you want to go first? Uh, Danny, uh, I think one of the things I'm definitely taking away is digging a little more even in what you're doing in abstract Wikimedia. Uh, and in being able to be in this panel, I've come to appreciate a lot more because I found myself doing a lot more research, which is very interesting because if researchers like me who work in this area don't know as much. And I think about this discussion, discussion with Wikimedia, especially in the global south, it means there's some disconnect that we need to, to, to bridge. So I know one of the objectives that Wikimedia has is to scale areas that haven't been well represented, but to do that, you need resources. Not all volunteers are researchers or editors. I'm just being frank. But I appreciate the effort they have made. They have, I mean, I've looked, I've right now, I've even looked at Swahili, uh, Wikipedia. There's some fantastic stuff there. But I'm sure they're stretched. There's a lot more that could be done. So uh, resources need to be uh, available. And uh, but, so I really do appreciate. I'm not criticizing, but I'm just saying not all of them. And we need to get to the next level. And to get to the next level, we have to be brave about it. What is not working right? What do we need to do? Do you just want to move to the areas that have not been, uh, uh, we've not been to before because we just want to be included or we just want to say all languages matter or all people matter? Do, uh, let's do it that, let's be serious about why we want to do it. And I'm sure we are, that's why we're having this conversation. And finally, find out 
especially these areas that we want to scale to, the countries and all that, what do they care about? And then we we'll work to deliver what they care about, what in whatever language. And remember, those with cheaper and easier access can volunteer more. I'm done. Thank you, Catherine. Denny, your last words. Thank you. Yeah, I learned a lot from Catherine today, and I will actually go back to the recording in order to unpack, particularly her opening statement, in order to really understand the, um, the situation of uh, potential contributors in the, in the region and to, um, and to see. I also really much appreciated uh, her shouting out to Wiki Functions, which I was planning like to just not, not introduce today at all because I thought this is a little complex and so on. And um, and I'm taking away that I, I really should work more on this narrative and, and, and figure out how to tell the story, but also to keep a really a mind on, you know, and, and, and this, perhaps like Wikipedia won't be a solution, as I said earlier. And there's so, so many layers on this, the access to the internet, um, the, the perception of the different languages by the individual speakers and, um, and the understanding of the potential contributors and readers of what an encyclopedia actually is and stuff like this. So, so all this and, and, and how they expect information to be packaged. Um, there's, there's a lot of data to unpack. And I also saw the, uh, with one eye following a little bit in the text, there have been a lot of great comments in the chat and I want to take another look at those and see what's going on here. Uh, and also to be reminded to, to leave enough interfaces to work with, with, the, with, the, with academia in particular and research projects in academia. So I, um, I have to really make sure that there are, that the opportunities are visible and opened um, so that um, people doing research can think, how could my work actually fit into that and make uh, make most impact of, of the project? So, th so there's plenty of stuff I want, I'm taking out here to, uh, to work on. Thank you very much both. It's been a great uh, pleasure and honor to, uh, um, to chair this panel and to um, kind of moderate this, this conversation. It's been, I've learned a lot and uh, I'm sure that it's the same for, for a lot of people in the audience. So uh, thanks a lot for, uh, for joining us today. Catherine, after a very long day and uh, Danny, for getting up at the inhumane time of 9 a.m. <laughs> so thanks a lot. And uh, I hope to be 